Hopefully today. Put your hand on your heart. We're going to pray for you today. You're going to pray for yourself as we share the word. It's your responsibility to prepare your heart. You may say, well, Pastor, you do this every time you preach. Yeah, because our heart needs to be ready every time to receive the word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts today. We open up our hearts to receive from you, God. We thank you that God, so many times in our life, the lack that we have is never because of you. But the lack is because we don't trust we don't give to you everything. And God, today, we pull back every restriction. And God, we open our lives wide open to you. And we pray, God, Holy Spirit, touch us. Work in our lives. Change our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name. Come on, shout amen in the house. Come on, high five two people around you and say, you better be here for 11 o'clock too. You better be here for 11. Come on, tell some people you need to buy a t-shirt too. And while you're buying one, buy one for me with that special deal. Huh? Come on, buy a shirt for me too. Two for $30. That's a deal. Buy one for me too. Wow, I'm so excited. Even though this is conference, I just really felt that for this particular session, this particular message, we're going to continue our series that we are in during this month, and that is finding answers to tough questions. In fact, it's really become finding the answer to the tough question. Because really it hasn't been answers to questions, it's been an answer to a question. And the question that we have asked this week, and we're going to continue to ask throughout this month, is this, why does God allow suffering? Why does God allow suffering? If you haven't said that to someone, you've sure thought that. And maybe you're really living in the middle of that right now, because that's life. That's where we find ourselves. And that's why I believe this message fits so perfectly in the conference when we've been talking about restoring what God has given to us. Restoring life, hope, purpose, dreams, fulfillment, God given back to your life. Because sometimes it's hard to see a good God when you think He's really bad. Yeah, right. If God really loves me, then why am I struggling? Why am I suffering? Why am I facing these things? Sometimes it can be hard for us to really love God when we're in the pain, when we're in the struggle, and especially when other people are saying, I thought God took care of you. I thought God loved you. And the enemy comes in too. Because why? Suffering can come in endless varieties of forms and no human being is ever immune to it. In fact, here's our statement. Look at this. Suffering undoubtedly brings the single greatest challenge to our Christian faith. Yeah. I really believe that. It brings the single greatest challenge to our Christian faith. Why should I suffer? Give my life to Christ. Everything should be great. Everything should be hunky-dory. Everything should be awesome. You say hunky-dory over here? Yeah. You do? Cool. Just wanted to make sure that it wasn't just like a, a moment of England and I just lost you all in, in the mix of all of that. But here's our theme scripture. You ready? Romans 8, 28. And this is a scripture I really believe you need to memorize. But I will say this. This scripture is not just a license to sin. Listen to me. This scripture isn't just a license to sin. That I could just go off and do whatever I want because the key to it all is in the middle. Those who love God. Those who love God. Now loving God doesn't mean you're perfect, but surely loving God or loving someone means you don't want to continually hurt them. You may mess up and you make mistakes, but hopefully sorry means what? I'm not going to do that again. Not whoops, I got caught. So until the next time, I can just keep doing it till I'll have to say sorry again. Are you with me in the house? Come on, say I'm with you, Pastor. Come on, Romans 8, 28. And we know. No, no. you got to know this. And that's why we're teaching you, because maybe you didn't know this, or maybe you need to be reminded of this. That's why the seasons that we go through in our life and the messages in the series, because you need to know this stuff for your life. And you need to know that God causes everything to work together for good. In other words, God takes everything. The mistakes, the failures, the good, the bad, everything. God can take those things, the result of our lives, and God can work those things for good. And He does that for those who love Him, who love God, and those who are called according to His purpose for them. Every one of us are called, but the Bible says few have chosen. 
Don't say, well, God hasn't called me. Everyone has been called of God. The problem is few have chosen to heed the call and to accept the call. But you got to know, what did we talk about last week? You got to know the right thing in the wrong time. And it's not really the wrong time, but it feels like the wrong time to us. Suffering and pain, that's wrong. That doesn't feel right. But you've got to know the right thing amidst the noise and the pain and the struggle. And that is this. You've got to know that God is working with it. Yeah, that's right. God's working with it. You're a work in progress. Even today, if it's a direct result of your sin, you know that where you're at is because of sin. No doubts, ifs, or buts. You know that where you're at is but God can still work with that. Yeah. If you'll say, God, I surrender it to you. I love you. I give you my life. God can take those things. Why? Yeah, here's what's so powerful about <coughs> repentance. Are you ready? It recruits God into your situation. Yeah. 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 It invites God. It allows God to come in and turn around a great mess into great mess. Yeah. Yeah. And it recruits God. When I repent and crawl out to God, it includes God. It brings God. It surrenders to God everything that I've created and have held on to. Now I'm giving it to Him. And thank God for His forgiveness, but also thank God for His grace. Yeah. Amen. Why do I need the grace of God for forgiveness? Yes, but I need the grace of God to be able to live. Amen. The strength each and every day. Why? Because of the sin and the suffering of this world. I'm living in some consequences of my life. Yeah. Come on, I'm living in some consequences. I've gone through a divorce in my life. You know the consequences that we've had to live through as a family is this. Family with kids go in different homes. That's tough. Yeah. Really tough on kids. Really tough on kids. There's consequences. You don't just give your life to Christ and then all of a sudden everything. God gives you the grace to work through even the mistakes of your life. And gives you the grace as a pathway, listen to me, it's a pathway to your new life. Some of us look and say, man, the consequences are too much for me. No, it's just an opportunity for you to step into the promises that God has for you. It's baby steps every day. Just keep stepping. Just keep believing. And last week that we discovered through Scripture from the Bible, we see from Genesis all the way through Revelation, that there are actually four main overlapping insights or what we want to call helps, to help me through the question, why does God allow suffering? To help me through the fire. The first one was human freedom. We talked about that last week. This week we're going to talk about how God works through suffering. Say with me, through suffering. <laughs> through suffering. Next week we're going to talk about God more than compensates for my suffering. And then last week, we're going to talk about how God is involved in my suffering. He doesn't leave me. Yeah. He's right. there with me. Amen. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear. Why? Because I have a companion yeah. who's walking yeah. tall yeah. and true yeah. beside me, leading me through this because on the other side, He's already prepared a table. Yeah. 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 We're going through this. We're going through this. So what did we discover last week talking about human freedom? Because that's the reason we're in this mess. It's because of us. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's your fault too. You know, it's us. It's human freedom that we have. What we discovered was this. We discovered that suffering was not a part of God's original creation. God did not create the world of suffering. But due to sin, as it entered the world, we see suffering began. What did we discover last week? Well, God allowed sin to enter this world. We, we say, well, why did God do that? The answer was this, because He... Someone listened last week. One person. Why? Because God loves us. Say that with me. God loves us. Because what do we know about love? Love is not love unless there's a real choice. He could have forced Himself upon us easily. Yeah. But then we wouldn't have really loved Him. We would have had no choice. And therefore there would have been no love. But He gave us a choice and still the choice is that. So when we feel due to our suffering that God doesn't love us and that He's punishing us, the opposite is actually true. He loves you. Thank you, Lord. 
You need to listen to last week's message again, I think, because some of you obviously missed some important points. Listen to it. Grab it on the CD. Listen through the website. All our messages are on podcasts. You can listen to them on your phone, your computer, when you're driving, when you're at work. But if you're listening to it at work, make sure you are working. <laughs> so today, we're going to talk about God works through our suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Because God loves us, He uses suffering for good in a number of different ways. Now what do we know about suffering? Suffering is not good in itself. I, I don't say thank God for the suffering. Thank God for the pain. It's not a good thing, but yet it's a God thing. God can use that thing. Come on. It's not good in itself, nor is it directly caused by God, but God is able to use it all for good. God can turn it around. And I pray that will bring you hope today. Even if you're guilty of bringing unnecessarily suffering into your life, God has not finished with your mess yet. God wants to work through those things and help you. So let's go on a journey today and look at some reasons how God can use my suffering for good. Number one, suffering is used by God to draw us to Christ. Most of you can say amen to that. Amen. In fact, I believe every one of you, most of you are saved because of a hardship probably that yeah, happened right. in your life. Yeah. But when you hit rock bottom and suddenly yeah. you realize you weren't as big and bad as you thought you were and your friends weren't as good as you yeah. assumed that they were and that life and the direction that you were going wasn't as fun as you thought yeah. it was right. and all of a sudden you see the greatest thing in life that you've been missing all the time is right there in front of you, and it's Jesus. Jesus. I love what C.S. Lewis wrote. He says these words, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but He shouts in our pain. And this is proven true time and time again in countless lives and in the Christian experience. Because many have only turned to God as a result of suffering. The loss of a loved one, we can see many people come to know Christ through that. Yeah. Broken relationships, doctor's reports, not looking good. Pain in our lives, separation, addiction, brokenness, brings us what? Draws us to Christ. Nothing turns us to God more than when we are driven to our knees in desperation. Just the sad fact is this. We have a short-term memory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, we forget what God has done yeah. for our lives. Yeah, right. yeah, Thankfulness, I think, is one of the greatest ways that we should and need to live our lives because the attitude of gratitude will take us further yeah. than we could ever imagine in our life. Right. Ten people were healed when they came in the presence of Jesus. Yeah. Ten lepers were healed, but yeah. only one was made whole. Come on, one was whole, one was completely set free in their life. And which one was that? The one that gave thanks. I make sure every day that my day is surrounded by thankfulness <coughs> to God. Even my worst days, I still thank God because my worst days is a whole lot better than most people's best days. And I have got so much to be thankful for. And if you're struggling to be thankful for what you have, stop being thankful that you haven't got what you deserve. And that may help you with that. But it's so sad that we have such a short term memory. Remember 9-11 and it rocked our nation and really rocked the world. But what happened as a result of 9-11? This nation was brought back to God. Yeah. Churches were packed and full everywhere as people came seeking and people were praying. All of a sudden these people who were against prayer, they were joining with other people and they were crying out to God and, yeah. and there was oh. prayer. But yet short term memories, where are those people still today? Right. Come on. They come and get their God fix and then they see their lives restored yeah. and peace come right. back and then they leave God in the right. dust right. and yeah. say, God, I don't need you anymore. I love the story of Bartimaeus. You can't call him blind Bartimaeus because he ain't blind no more. Anyway, I love the story of Bartimaeus in the Bible. And you probably know what I'm about to say about him. But here's what I want to say today. is Out of all the cries that day, why him? You think he was the only one that was crying that day? And when I mean crying, I'm not talking about tears. I mean crying out, Jesus! 
Jesus! Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you, everybody that day was crying the same yeah. name. And they were crying it out in their way. But why him? Why him? Mark 10, 49. So Jesus stood still. Say with me, stopped. <laughs> Jesus stopped and commanded him to be caught. And then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise. Why? Because Jesus is calling. What stopped Jesus? Why Bartimaeus out of everyone else in the crowd at that day? I believe there was a cry of desperation that came from his heart and his life. That he refused to be denied because people around him said, Be quiet, he's not interested in you. But he cried out loud. Yes. What about that lady? Remember with the flow of blood? She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. Yeah. Yeah. She had to crawl through the crowd, being trampled on and stamped on Stop to that. get to where she had. She could have given up. Probably by the time she got to him, she was bloody and bruised because people had been stamping and kicking. Right. Why? Because you ain't getting to Jesus if I can't get to Jesus. Right. Right. Yeah. Don't look at me holy. You know how you are. Yeah. <laughs> You ain't cutting the line. If I can't get there, you ain't cutting the line. Look at this statement. Suffering and pain, I believe, can produce that cry and that touch in our lives that brings you to Jesus where you will never be the same again. Come on, when you're desperate, there's something that stirs your heart like never before. Something that makes you dig in like never before. So God, why does suffering and pain happen in my life? Maybe because God needs you to be drawn back to Him. Because yeah. He uses those things. He doesn't create those things, but He uses those things to build relationship with you. Because there's nothing else like a love relationship with God. Number two, why does God? God uses suffering to mature mature so I wrote down this maturity is not just growth it's healthy growth yes maturity is health not just growth you, you can grow by eating burgers but that don't mean you're going to be healthy <laughs> So many times in my life we think, well, I'm getting older, so that means I'm going to be wiser. That means, no, maturity is different to growing. Yeah. It's growing with health. It's healthy growing. And I believe that God can use the suffering of our life to grow us in a healthy yeah. way. Even in the life of Jesus, He wasn't exempt from suffering. Look what it says in Hebrews 5 verse 8. Though He was a son, and not just a son, He was the Son of God. How did he learn obedience? <laughs> By the things that he what? The things that he suffered. You see, here's what you've got to know. You ready? God can use your suffering to build your character. And character is essential for you to live a godly life. In the New Testament, one of the images used to help us with this is that of the discipline of children. Why do we discipline parents? Why do we discipline our children? For whose benefit do we discipline our children? For theirs. For theirs. But really we do it for both. Because we benefit from it too. But we mainly do it for the reason of we want them to be mannerable. We want them to be respectful. We want them to do the right things. They don't see that as a child so we have to gently correct them and redirect their lives, but really the discipline also can be for both too because it does bring joy to our hearts also. But look at this example in Hebrews chapter 12, going to read from the New Living in verse 10 it says, For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we may share in His holiness. God is trying to help you. He's trying to build you. He's trying to make you holy. Come on, He's trying to make you holy. Right with Him. And it goes on to say, no discipline is enjoyable. And you can say amen to that. Amen. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. Thank you, God. I'm really enjoying this. Thank you, Mum and Dad. Thank you for my hot pants. I really enjoy them. 
appreciate it. I can feel your love. I, I love the way you express your love. I, I'm feeling you. I'm feeling you. No, no, you're not. It's not happening. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's not happening. <laughs> Why? Because it's painful. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest yeah. of right living for those who are trained in this way. One translation says, who are trained by it. By what? By discipline. Don't like it, but it's needed to produce what? A peaceful harvest in my life. Peter uses another image or another example, that of a metal worker who's refining silver and gold. And he writes this in 1 Peter 1 verse 6. He says, So be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. He says, don't give up. There's joy that's going to come through this, even though right now there's suffering. But notice, suffering is not forever. It's a season and a moment. Yeah. When we read the book of Job, we can think, man, that poor guy suffered for years and years and years. That wasn't the case. It just seems like that was the case. And the enemy wants us to think like we're never going to get through this. But the Bible says we've got to be glad. Why? Because we're going to have to suffer some things, but for a little while. A little while. And he goes on to explain why God allows this. Verse 7. These trials will show you that your faith is God's working on your faith. It's a yeah. faith thing. That God wants to build your faith. Yeah. It says it has been tested as fire. Tests and purifies God. Though your faith is far more precious than gold. Can you see what God is saying here? To us, gold is so valuable. Man, if I could have gold, wow. But God said, you've got to see beyond that because you have more value than that what the world may label as the greatest value. God says, I value you more. Because He says, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Wow, I love that. There's purpose through the suffering. God wants to mature me. God wants to develop me. God wants to build me. God wants to strengthen me. My faith is being tested so it will be genuine. So it will remain. It will last. You know how a refiner knows if the metal he is refining is pure? When he looks in it and he sees his own reflection. That's what God's doing in his life. In your life. He's looking every day, can I see myself wow. in Frank today? Can I see myself in Frank today? Can I see myself in Pastor Rob today? Can I see myself in Renee? Can I see myself in Christy? Can I see myself in Tony today? And that's what God is doing. Yeah. It's for your good. Yeah. It's for your good. Number three, God uses suffering to make us more fruitful. God, there's not another way. Am I the only one that thinks like that? Come on, am I the only one? I mean, come on, God. I mean, you created the world. There's no better way that you could have done through the pain of my life. But what did we say earlier? There's nothing that brings us to our knees. Back to God like that. Jesus actually uses another example. So we see... The example of discipline in a child of a finest fire. We actually then see through Jesus the example of a gardener who is pruning a vine. And Jesus says this in John 15 too. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may what? Bear more fruit. Any of us when we're facing suffering will at times ask, what's the purpose of this? Going through that pruning is not easy and it's not something we enjoy and we can look and say, what's, what's the purpose of this? We maybe even have said or thought things like this, can God be even found in this? God, are you even a part of this? Because I'm struggling with this. Where are you? <coughs> Romans 8.28 reminds us that he's there working in those things yeah. when we don't see it. Smith Wigglesworth wrote these words. He says, great faith is the product of great fights. 
Great testimonies are the outcome of great tests. Yeah. And great triumphs can only come after great triumphs. Amen. God wants to produce fruit in your life. No one would wish suffering upon themselves or other people, but yet, testimony after testimony, yeah. we have heard how great pain and suffering became the most transformational season in that person's life. Because through it, fruit was produced. Yeah. Number four, God uses suffering as a witness to other people. What are you saying, Pastor? Our suffering and the way we suffer can be an example to others. It needs to be a witness to other people. That when you're going through the trials, people are looking at you and saying, how can they still function? How can they still have a smile on their face? How can they have such peace? I know what they've just gone through. they just lost a loved one. Their, their kids in hospital being given a horrific report. But yet, why are they still smiling? Why are they still going to church? Why are they still got their hands in the air and praising God? Come on, you can be a great witness through what you're facing in life. Come on, look at this statement. Our witness may never be stronger than when we're in the fire. Amen. Come on, when we're in the fire and other people are watching, Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, your character. You think that just means when everything's going good? Because if that's the case, then more than half the time probably they ain't seeing good. But God says you got to let your light shine bright every day, every moment, every season, every opposition, every blessing. You need to still be shining bright. Why? Because the witness of your life leads other people to Christ. That they will see your life and what happens? They will give glory to God. Yeah. They'll look and say, the only way they can have that smile is there's got to be something stronger on the inside of them than the pressures that are on the outside. That's why Paul says we may be crushed, we may be perplexed. Come on, but we're not destroyed and we're not knocked down. Why? Because we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellence may be of God and not of us. Come on, what a witness you can be through the dark. right now, I've preached some of the greatest messages going through the greatest hells of my life. Amen. Why? Because it brings something out of you. Because you have to lean totally on God. You can't stand on your own two feet when you're going through a struggle. But that's okay. Because He's there to lift you up. He's there to hold you. He's there to bring you through. Because Paul said, I can't bear this any longer. But God says, my grace is sufficient. And even Christians are soft, let me tell you something. That ain't soft when you can smile and your heart is broken. It ain't soft when you can hold a door open, but yet you don't know where your kids are at. But I'm telling you, what are you doing? You're doing the right thing, because you're like the Father. You're looking every day and preparing, because they're coming home. Life is going to be turned around. Situations are going to come. Today, so I'm getting all in one message. Come on, take a praise break right now and give us some praise.
expect to see you broken, but you're not. When others are ready to excuse your behavior because they know what you're going through. When Jesus is in your heart, they're going to stand amazed because they're ready to see you break. They're ready to see you bend. They're ready to see you bow. But here you are, standing tall and true. It's only when you crush the lavender that you can find the true fragrance. It's only when you squash an orange that you can extract its sweet juice. It's the same with our pains and our hurts and our sufferings. That through those we can show the sweetness and the fragrance of Jesus to a world that has no hope. As I was studying this message, I read the story of an agnostic professor of philosophy at Princeton University. It doesn't get much worse than that, does it? An agnostic professor of philology at Princeton University. And he became a Christian. And the reason he became a Christian was because he studied the lives of some of the greatest saints of God throughout the history of the church. And what struck him was this. Look at this slide. Their radiance in the midst of their pain. Every one of them who were beheaded, crucified, beaten, abused. One thing that came out through it all was their radiance in the midst of the pain and the suffering. That no matter the opposition against them, there had to be, he said, a greater power that was working inside of them. He said that pain must be beyond human ability. Yeah. Yes. And it was that that brought him to his knees. Yeah. The suffering well of other people yeah. brought him to his knees. Come on, we've got to learn how to suffer well. Yeah. I said we've got to learn how to suffer well. Yeah. We've we got to suffer well. We're not building a house in suffering. It's just a tent because we're coming through it. But I think sometimes we stay in it longer than we need to because until we can start thanking God through the pain and the struggle, He's going to leave us a little bit there. Come on, we've got to suffer well because others are watching. Christy stole my scripture today, Acts 16, 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. They were singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were what? Listening to them. How will you respond now, you Bible preaching people of Jesus? We see you on the streets when everything's good, saying, hey, everything's good about Jesus. But now you're at midnight, you're in stocks, you've been beaten, you're abused. How good is your God right now? And at midnight, the darkest time, Paul and Silas couldn't lift their arms because they were in stocks but they lifted their hearts and they began to sing how great is our God sing with me how great is our God that all would see how great how great is our God he's a name above all names come on he is one The jail was shaken. Let me tell you, there was revival that took place because every prison door opened and not one prisoner left. That's revival. I said, that's revival. Hey, work in the nursery for five minutes and leave the door open and see how many kids are going to stay. Come on, we're ready to get out of here. I've never been ready to prison and found one person who thought they were... Guilty, it should be there. Everyone wants to be out. The doors were opened. And you know what kept them in that place? The testimony, I believe, of Paul and Silas. They said, we've got to stay and see what's happened because there's something greater here than our physical freedom. There's a spiritual freedom that we've got to find. I'm telling you right now, you've got to suffer well because people's spiritual freedom is relying on you. Look at this statement, man. I'm glad I don't have to try and preach this message again. <laughs> I think if we had an 11 o'clock service, I'd just play the CD and say, you've got to listen to this. <laughs> Look at the statement. People may not be able to identify with your success, but they can relate to your pain. Yeah. Yeah. 
In fact, people might envy you and resent you for your success. Look at you and your car, look at you and your house, look at you and your nice clothes. I remember being on the streets of England, we used to go out and we used to evangelize, and some guy came up to me and said, man, look at you in all your nice clothes and your shoes and your jacket, you're coming up here to tell me about Jesus. I said, here you go. Take it. I took my shoes off and I took my jacket off and I said to him, you can have it. It was a freezing night that night and I was cold afterwards. My feet were cold. But I said to him, that's not the gospel. That, that's not what life is to me. If you need those things, you can have them because what's important to me is Jesus. You see, when you begin to share your struggles, when you begin to share your pain, when you begin to be transparent, come on, we think as Christians we've got to be perfect and everything's got to be right. That's why people can't relate to us because they know we are not, we're not perfect and they think we're disillusioned. Yeah. We're weird and we're crazy. We're in denial. Yeah. Come on. They can relate through your pain. You still with me today? Yeah. Say purpose through the pain. Come on, say it like you mean it. Purpose through the pain. Number five. This is the last one and then I'm finished. I've got 33 seconds. Come on, who'll give me 33 seconds? Who'll give me That's about 10 more minutes. I just got that one. Number five. God uses our suffering to bring about His good purpose. God doesn't create it, but He uses it. Does not cause it, but works through it. Perhaps the best example of this we see in the scriptures is the life of Joseph. Most people's story is about a chapter or a few verses at most. Joseph's story is 14 chapters from Genesis 37 to 50. He went through a lot. Joseph suffered rejection by his closest family. He was forcefully removed to Egypt and sold as a slave. He was imprisoned for a crime he did not commit. And for 13 years he faced trials, temptations and testings. Until the age of 30 he finally became the ruler of Egypt. A position now that God placed in him not only to save his life but to save other people too. And at the end of his life, he was able to speak to those who caused the suffering of his life. His brothers stood in front of him. Those who caused it, he was able to stand to them and say, Genesis 50 verse 20, he says, but you meant it for me for harm. You meant it as evil against me. But God used it. Come on, do you see what I'm saying? God turned it around. God didn't make that happen. That was man's choices and decisions. And Joseph now lives in the consequence of those. But God says, no matter how you find yourself in the fire, I'm still the fourth man that can deliver you through. No matter how you got in the storm, God says, I'm still the one that can say peace and stay. And he said, God has meant it for good. In order to bring about this day and to save many people alive. It's not always easy to see at the time. When you're going through it. What God is doing. I wonder if earlier in his life if Joseph would have been able to see it. When we can't work it out and we can't understand it. What are we going to do? No. No. Trust God. Believe God. Keep going on. And not quit. Because we've got to refuse not to let go of what we don't know. Or what we do know. For what we don't know. One more story and then I'm going to pray for you today. Hadley Moulay, I believe is how you pronounce it. He was the Bishop of Durham in England. And one day he had the task of visiting the relatives of 170 miners who had been killed in a tragic mining accident in England. And while he was wondering what to say, he came across a little bookmark that his mother had given him. The bookmark that his mother had given him was hand-woven by her and hand-stitched. And I couldn't get one today, but I did something pretty close. Thank you, Leslie. And as he looked at the back of this bookmark, he saw no rhyme or reason and no pattern. But as he turned it around, on the other side, he saw the words, God is love. Today in your life, you may see a tangled thread. You maybe don't understand. 
know. They're struggling to see anything through the pain. But you've got to know through the darkest night. God is love. Would you bow your heads all over this place today? God works through your suffering. Because I'm telling you, He's producing something great inside of you. He's producing something great inside of you. Here's what I want to do. I, I just feel led to do this right now. I just want you to find a place to pray all over this place. If you want to come to the altar, that's fine. If you want to turn in your chair, you want to sit where you're at, bow your head. But here's my challenge. Do something. Make a move. Do something right now. I just want us to find a place to pray all over. Why? Because you can't tell me that you haven't struggled, but you're not struggling with something that we've talked about today. And you need God to make sense of some things in your life. You need God to give you the strength. And I'll even say this, you may not see the sense of those things for a long time yet, but I'm telling you, the promise is that joy is coming. And joy comes in the morning. And joy coming in the morning is not meaning what? Morning as in the next day. But joy sometimes comes through the morning of the sorrow and the brokenness of our lives. Because we've got to trust God and believe God. I wish today I could preach a message. I wish I could say that you're never going to have to suffer again. But if I preached that message, I would be a lie. And I would be lying to you. And as a result of lying to you, I would be robbing you from the growth and the maturity and the witness and the fruitfulness that God wants to produce in your life. We don't like it. But let me tell you right now, the reward for outweighs the struggle and the sacrifice. Maybe today you're in that place of suffering because of your sin and disobedience. What can I do, Pastor? Repent. Recruit God into your situation right now. Maybe it's nothing to do with you. It's just the fact of life and circumstances and other people. And you're suffering because of other people's decisions. What are you going to do? The answer is still the same. Praise God. The answer is still the same. Come on, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Paul and Silas, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do in that prison cell? I thought you were serving God. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I thought God was a God of love. What are you going to do? You're in pain. You're in suffering right now. Come on.
suffer. We're going to suffer well. Why? Because there's a purpose. There's a purpose through all of this. Purpose through this. Amen. I told this story in an illustration. It is so good and I need to tell it again. That one day someone was watching a butterfly trying to break out of a chrysalis. A cocoon, is that what they call it? A chrysalis. It was trying to break free and it saw the struggle. It was beginning to break but it saw the struggle. And it thought, my God, it's never going to make it out. So what do we like to do? We like to help. Don't we? we like to get involved in things. So gently that person began to just help began to break back that cocoon until all of a sudden the butterfly sprang forth. But the butterfly didn't fly. The butterfly fell to the ground. And they watched as the butterfly flapped and flapped and flapped and just spun around in circles. Never went airborne for more than a split second and fell back down and never picked it up and tried, but yet it just fell back to the ground. They couldn't understand. You see, what they didn't realize was that it was the fight and it was the struggle and it was the push to break free that caused the muscles and the strength to come into the body to cause it to be able to fly. Without that struggle and without that fly, it couldn't fly. I'm telling you right now, God's not called you to be a chicken. Come on, click it around in the... God's called you to be an eagle and to soar and to fly high. And you may say, God, you think my wings, God, I don't like where I'm at. But God says, no, no, I'm just preparing you for greater heights because we've got places that we're going. But through the struggle, I'm producing something in your life. In the name of Jesus right now, I pray for everyone in this place. God, I know that when we normally preach a message yes. Yes. and messages, God, I know it's for definitely people in the house. But perhaps greater than ever, I think we can confidently say that this message is for everyone. Yes. 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 Everyone. Yes. But we thank you, God of the struggle we're in and how we got there. The way out is the same. We've got to know you, God. And God, we place our faith in you, God. We want to suffer well. We got, God, people are watching us at work. People are looking at us. God, we want to be fruitful in our lives and we want our fruit to remain. God, we want to be close to you and drawn to you. God, we want all those things, but yet, God, we want them without the suffering. We want to eat the meal without preparing the food. We want to sit down at the table and just enjoy the reward. But realizing there's a price that has to be paid. There's a process that has to be endured. The Bible says that he that makes it to the end shall receive. He who endures to the end shall receive eternal life. God, that's what you're doing. You're disciplining us and you're correcting us. Why? Because we don't enjoy it at the moment. But you're producing a harvest of peace inside of us and a change. God, even though our lives look and it looks like a tangled mess, God, we're going to look again and see that God is love. God is love. If you receive that today, say amen. amen. Just before I hand it back to Christy, the key to it all is this, knowing God. You got to know Him, yeah. and we're not just talking about knowing of God, because I can read a book and know of God. But the knowing we're talking about is an intimate relationship. Yeah. And God decides that with yeah. everyone. That's why we're created, unlike any other form of creation. In the image and likeness of God. Why? Because that's how we have relationship with Him. Because we are like Him. Yeah. He created us to be in relationship with Him. And if that's you today and you want to give your life to Christ. Here's what I'm asking right now. Come and stand right here at the front with me. Come on, you want to rededicate your life. You want to make sure everything's right. Come on, stand here with me.
there anyone? Come on, come all over this place. You may say, Pastor, you're not making it easy. Listen, it's not an easy life. But I'm telling you, the rewards far outweigh the sacrifice. Is there anyone today that you would come and say, Pastor, pray for me? Is there anyone? 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 Precious to you. Say, Holy Father, I pray for lives in this place right now. I pray that not one person would leave here today without knowing you. And God, I thank you today that, God, we can know you in a greater way. Just everyone in this place, just say these words with me today. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I want to know you. I want to know you. Not of you, but I want to believe in you. Come into my heart. Change me. Transform me. And renew me, I pray. 